I love collecting comic books, but is it also okay if I sell comic books? Hey there, today I have an unboxing video and in this video I'm going to open up two orders that I placed with Mile High Comics. I am really falling behind. I ended up buying more comic books online than I actually open and grade. And part of the reason why I'm so lazy about opening up my orders is that I am afraid to sell comic books and not that I'm afraid to part with them, although I do feel like I'm more of a, a comic book hoarder, wait and see kind of collector. But part of the laziness is, I want to say the hassle with selling. Uh, and I say that with all respect to everybody that's out there hustling and selling comic books and, and all of that. But there's part of me that I don't necessarily mind parting with a book. Now, some of these books, especially the ones behind me, I, I probably would have a difficult time parting with but it's the actual process of selling. And I still am not talking about the actual transaction and packing up a book. I don't mind that. In fact, uh, I kind of find that to be part of the fun. You get to kind of pretend that maybe you're a comic book dealer or you have your own store. I used to do this as a kid where I used to put physical stickers on the outside of my bags and boards with uh, what the comic was worth and I had to then go through and rebag all of those over time. I still found some old comics in my garage with the original sticker and the, the $1.25 written on it. And I've always had kind of a fascination with uh, owning a comic shop or running a comic shop. I tried to do this uh, earlier in my current phase of collecting where I ran a Shopify store. I actually tried this twice and it didn't work out just because I realized that it really wasn't who I am. I'm not a dealer and I'm not a comic book store owner. Although it is kind of a fantasy of mine and I think about it, it's just not something that I can dedicate my time to full time. So the other day what I was thinking about is I have a lot of collecting automation built to help me process my collection. But what I don't have built is automation for selling. And so I built this. And so part of what I've done is I've extended how I track my comic books with spreadsheets and other data sources and connected all of that to eBay through their API. So now what I can do is finally unbox these orders and go through and grade each book, catalog them into my personal collection. But now I can get them posted from my personal collection off to eBay for sale with the click of a button now instead of going through and creating a listing. I really did not find that part of the process enjoyable at all. It was very time consuming because I wanted a listing to be configured in a way that aligned itself to all of the metadata around a comic book. It's part of one of the reasons why I, I like it is just because there's some additional data surrounding every book from cover artist to UPC, original cover price, release date, there's all of these interesting things, creators, stories, key elements in the stories, synopsis, there's a lot going on with the comic book itself. And I would always want to have that reflected in my listing. And it doesn't have to be eBay, it could be on Shopify, it could be on a live claim sale, although those interfaces don't really lend themselves to displaying a lot of data. And the point is, I couldn't bring myself to just have a listing with just like the title and the price and a picture. I had to really develop the listing out to have as much information. And I think it helps when you're searching for books if you have listings with a lot of information. So as a buyer, you can really kind of hone in uh, specifically on the item that you're looking for. And while I'm not going to go through that entire process today and bore you with it, it is something that I have now built that is part of my process that I will go through at some point. But what it has done is it has freed me up to go ahead and focus on opening orders again because now I have a much easier and flexible way of selling some of the books that I either have multiple copies of or I just don't want. And I have added yet another cue to my 
collecting process where I have cues for the PC, for grading, for sending out for pressing and cleaning. And now I will be introducing another queue of books that will not go into my PC and will go directly to storage where I fully expect to move on from these books. Yes, I just want to sell them, but also if I cannot sell them at what I think is a fair price, I will start to decrease the price until I'm able to move them so that buyers are maximizing their value add, but these are just books that are not as important to me now that my collection has grown uh, to the size that it currently is. Speaking of growing my collection, I want to get to the unboxing of these couple of orders so I can figure out which cues to put these books in. Okay, so here are the two orders that I placed with Mile High Comics. Uh, both were placed uh, about a week or two apart in October of 2023. And what I think is interesting about these two orders is I uh, forgot that I already ordered some books. And when I end up placing orders and deciding which books to order, I have a priority list that looks at potential value add and then graded book potential. And sometimes the same books continually show up on the list and I, I just picture Mile High having like a long box of the same book that I keep buying. And it's like, here's this guy, he's buying one copy again. Uh, so you'll see some uh, multiples show up across the two orders, which is why I'm kind of comboing this uh, video into a double unboxing because there is some uh, duplication of some of the books that I ordered. I always choose FedEx when I'm checking out for Mile High Comics. You can choose that as an option. It's free shipping, $65 or more. So I always place orders that unlock free shipping. You just have to pay insurance. There's no additional charge for FedEx. And I pick that every time. So let me get these two envelopes opened up. All right, there we are. We've got uh, both orders unpacked. And let's take a look at the comics. Uh, I don't know if there's a particular order. It's funny, the first order didn't have bubble wrap around it. I don't know if they just forgot that step or whatever, but for the most part, it's pretty straightforward in terms of how they pack and deliver books. Very efficient with their shipping and their whole process. Uh, they do the, the two-day FedEx. Uh, again, no extra charge, no tax. You just pay a little insurance. Uh, if you stay to the end, I'll show you what I paid for the books and kind of break down the order summary. You can see why I picked these up, and uh, we'll take a look at the potential. Uh, let's take a look at the first book. Uh, this is Gore Shriek. Number one, this is a book that I've been picking up and it is one of those that I keep finding on Mile High for roughly the same price and I keep buying it just because the way this cover is constructed, the book, the way the, the book structure is, it's very difficult to get in high grade. Uh, this is the first interior art by artist Greg Capullo. This is considered to be kind of like copper underground horror but you can see just there's always something that's not quite right. A little bit of a peel back on this corner. Uh, again, typical mile high, very solid spine, structurally sound. And then there'll just be that one defect that just like, ugh. And then you can see, also see right here, a little bit of a finger bend on the bottom. Uh, so could most likely benefit from a press. A little bit of a, a peel back here on the top corner as well. Just a slight dog ear, just the tiniest of, of dog ears right there that would have to be pressed out. So probably a 9496 candidate. Uh, real quick too, there was a comment left on one of my videos that says I'm the only grader that does not grade the back of the book. Uh, I do grade the entire book when I grade it. This is just kind of a general screening. Uh, if I were to grade every book on every video, the videos would be several hours long and I don't think they'd be all that interesting, but if you are interested in watching me grade 12 or 15 comic books front and back, uh, let me know, uh, I'll be happy to do that. I just find it to be more of something I'll do on my own time and not necessarily burden you with that. Next is Jerry Iger's Famous Features. Now, now I'm, hmm. I don't know if I ordered the wrong book or they sent me the wrong book. This has never happened before. It's, I'm just going to assume that I ordered the wrong book. I will put the cover art of the book that I thought I was buying up. Uh, Joe Chiodo on cover art, but I specifically wanted the version that has famous features, not golden features. This was not a very expensive book, but I'll have to look into that. I still like this cover by Joe Chiodo. 
as this was uh, released in 1984, but not exactly the book I ordered, so I'll have to look into that. Next we have Thor 254, and at last we have the awesome origin of Thor's alter ego, Don Blake, also known as Donald Blake. Cover art here by Rich Buckler. Uh, just We just don't get covers like this anymore. Just fantastic art with Odin and Thor and Donald Blake here on the cover. Just looking at it again, sharp corners, uh, spine tick right there by Thor going across his arm and cape. But other than that, looks to be a really, really solid, nice book. So probably in the ballpark of maybe a 9.2 on that copy of Thor 254 from 1976. Next is Darth Vader number four. And this is the fourth print. Now I picked this up because I am a fan of Dr. Aphra. Uh, her first appearance was the issue before Darth Vader 3. She is also in Darth Vader 4, making this her second appearance. And just like Darth Vader 3, there are four different printings of the same cover that are color-coded, with the fourth print being this purple cover. And what I would love to do is have all four Darth Vader 3 printings and all four Darth Vader 4 printings and have them all kind of slabbed and lined up side by side. Right now, I am two of eight on that goal, so I do have a ways to go, but thought that this was a really great Adi Granov cover and a good deal at Mile High, so I went ahead and grabbed a copy. All right, next is Invincible, number 68. And, oh man, I can see this one's not really great at all. That is not from the cover art, those white chips off the cover, plus additional spine ticks, uh, stack increase. So this is unfortunate. So I'll probably have to reach out to them and see what their customer service says. I, I've never actually reached out to their customer service just because I've always had a good experience with Mile High. But uh, this is disappointing. This uh, copy is, is pretty beat up for quote unquote near mint copy. But I picked this up because uh, this is the first appearance of Dinosaurus. Uh, First cover appearance, I guess, as well. Uh, character in Invincible with Shocking um, can transform himself into a dinosaur. All right, now this next book, I feel like I'm including this in every order. This is Ex Infernus, number one. Great David Finch cover art featuring magic as Dark Child. And essentially, Mile High has this book for, you could basically call it cover price. I think cover price is uh, $3.99 on this book. Uh, it's a $5 book at Mile High, and I love picking up this book. Has a lot of value raw, uh, certainly value if it's graded as well. This one has a, a stack increase, but looks to be okay. Uh, maybe one tiny spine tick, hard to tell in the bag and board. Uh, but since I don't grade the back, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, great book to pick up. For me, it's just one of those sort of staples of every order. Um, every time it's there and it's still there, like I said, I feel like there's a long box of those and I just pick one up every time. Next is Red Sonia, number 17. And this is from 2014. This is the run of Red Sonia where Jenny Frizen uh, was doing the covers on Red Sonia. And this is the standard cover. There's also a variant of this that's pretty nice. It's kind of a black and white color spot type cover. Probably not my favorite of the Frizen Red Sonia covers, but as a Frizen collector and fan, maybe working on a full run, I figured why not go ahead and pick this one up. And then next we've got another issue of Invincible. This is Invincible 115, and this is a, a clearly a high number issue here at, at 115 where the series has been around for a while, clearly here because it's issue 115, but the series has been around for a while now, and the print run of these later issues of Invincible is starting to decrease, I think, and this cover art features Battle Beast as part of the Invincible universe. And what I ended up doing is I put the full run of Invincible in my analysis tooling, and again, it helped prioritize which were the better uh, Invincible books to pick up from Mile High Comics. The last book in this order is House of Secrets, Number 119, cover art on this one by Luis Dominguez, listed as near mint, and looks to be a pretty strong copy. I do not believe any sort of 9-8 candidates would ever slip in, and you can see that a lot of tearing here on the staple 
is probably preventing this one from uh, getting anywhere near a 9.6 or a 9.8, but a strong copy otherwise. Like I said, there's another color break there. Very typical mile high, structurally sound, solid book. Just a couple of defects that's pulling it down into the 8.5 to 9.2, 9.4 range. But really strong colors. What I like is that, yes, it will have a couple of defects, but a book like this will have all kinds of damage done to it, typically fading. And you can see the colors here are super strong and vibrant. And also think about the time I placed this order, October, which I, I say is the absolute worst month to buy any sort of horror or Halloween theme books, and yet I do it anyway. Okay, on to the next stack here, and I'll just go ahead and do this one since it's staring right at me. And this is G.I. Joe Transformers number one. And I remember uh, when I first picked up this book off the spinner rack, I was like, okay, um, they're literally destroying one of the greatest Autobots of all time, Bumblebee. I have to pick this book up and see what G.I. Joe is up to. And this copy looks to be really, really nice. I don't really see any spine takes course with the white background. It could be hiding them, but a nice solid copy here of G.I. Joe and the Transformers number one. Next up is Iron Man 57. I splurged on this one. Big Iron Man fan, but also a uh, sucker for the 20 cent covers. I just feel like those are eventually just the supply is just going to run dry at some point. Uh, this cover is miswrapped, this copy of it anyway and the staples on top making it difficult if it did require a clean and press. And unfortunately, I see a color breaking tick there. But again, I don't mind spending a little bit of extra money to secure these 20 cent covers, a little bit of uh, color breaking damage on the edge of the book there. So, you know, again, like a 992, which I think is outstanding for a book like this. And although I love Iron Man, the series is not just flush with keys. So on one hand, it's pretty easy to collect a full run on the other you're not left with a full run of keys but the big one for me is 55 the first appearance of Thanos and like I say if you can't buy the key buy around the key and here clearly issue 57 near issue 55 as I start to build out my full run of the original Iron Man series now this book we've got the darling of all comic book speculators all over the universe this is bloodstone number four to me she's almost like a meme character at this point because everyone just cannot stop speculating on her that the latest news she's going to get her own spin-off show out of the werewolf by night one shot on disney plus and just people can they're just so heavily invested in this character they cannot stop talking about her I love this cover because of the Raiders of the Lost Ark homage. It's uh, even got the, the trade and just the, the general look and feel of the issue. Now, I can see with this being an all-black cover is there are some spine ticks here. Let me get the light in there. So it will require a press if I do want it improved beyond its current condition. But if they do break color, they're, they're hairline. They're very, very tiny, but still, they're, this is not, again, a 9-8 candidate on its own. However... I did want to secure it because these typically don't last long as, again, like I said, people love to pick up this original Bloodstone limited series, and that's another corner that would have to be pressed out. So this, I think it would be a good challenge for one of my pressing contacts to work on, probably is a 9.4 or 9.6 max, but like I said, I love to pick these books up because speculators are just so heavily invested they're just not going to let the character go they want to constantly talk about her next is tales to astonish number 85 another book i splurged on as this too was listed in near mint and gorgeous copy here with hulk on the cover this book is from 1966 just slightly miswrapped where we see the price going along the spine but take a look at this really nice Again, just barely, you know, some softening on the corner. Not going to be a 9.8 because of that. You're going to get, I think, a little bit of forgiveness because of the age. But the edge of this book looks super sharp all the way down to that corner. Looking great. It's just this is the problem corner here. Right there. 9.4, 9.2, maybe even a 9.0 at this point. But I ask myself, too, would I rather have this book and pay for it in fine condition and deal with all of the spine ticks, or would I rather pay more money, pay a premium to get it in this high grade? Yeah, it's not a 9.8 candidate, but 
I love having these older books in high grade and I don't mind paying the extra money just because I feel like if I'm paying less for a lesser copy, the chances of that lesser copy, especially on a, a non-key, rising up and spiking in value, it's going to take that book longer to rise in value than it is the, the ones in the higher grade, obviously, just because the higher grade copies are in more demand. And even as, as folks get upset with CGC and, and they think about, I'm just going to collect raws again, raw high grade copies, ungraded, speculated on for their condition, going to be, I think, valuable as we move forward. All right, and then we got a few books to go. Again, it's almost just like I've got the same books in my shopping cart. Vanguard Illustrated, number two, awesome. Dave Stevens cover art. Absolutely love this book. I pick it up anytime I can. Unfortunately, it's a really uh, sort of badly placed spine tick right there. Uh, that's very unfortunate and very obvious. I think that if somebody is interested in this book, they're probably looking at certain places on this cover and you really cannot miss the fact that there is a little bit of damage to the book right there. Other than that, it looks to be a pretty straightforward copy, probably in the 9.2 to 9.4 range. But regardless of the quantity, it, it appears on my list as a priority buy. And it's hard for me to pass up even if I already own the book. Just like this, another <laughs> copy of X and Furnace number one. Almost like I have to keep buying them until they run out of stock. Really great book there. And another copy of Gore Shriek, number one. Still on the lookout for a 9-8 candidate. The, gosh, the, the way that the book is put together, it's so tight around the staples where it's, it's not even a stack increase. It's almost just like the paper is just crunched or squished somehow. I did notice one spine tick. It's just, it's a hairline color breaking tick right there. That's going to prevent it from getting the 9.8. And it, it goes maybe a quarter inch into the book. So 9.4 once again. But there you have it. The two orders that I placed with Mile High Comics I definitely see some overlap with some of these titles. But lots of great books here that will all end up being high grade with maybe some 9.8 candidates. I think this one maybe has a shot. And what I want to do now is I'll show you what I paid for these books so you can see why I was targeting them as I'll compare them to fair market values if I were to keep them raw. And if I do decide to get them graded, what kind of potential values am I looking at when I compare what I paid for these books against graded values? So let's take a look at the order summary for these two orders. All right, here is the order summary for the two orders that I placed with Mile High Comics back in October of 2023. The first order, I was invoiced $187.20. The second order invoiced $260. No shipping, no tax on these books. I did have to pay for insurance $6 on in the first order, $8 for the second order. And what I just do is distribute the insurance across the cost of each book so that I can easily see door to door what it costs me to acquire the books. Now, if I'm looking at the books, assuming they're all near mint in a 9.4, and I'm comparing my total cost to column U, which is the cover price fair market value, you can see that on each order, I had a positive raw book value gain. The first order, $72.80 of positive value, and the second order, $128 of positive value. So just kind of going over the highlights here, Invincible number 115 has a cover price fair market value of $50. I paid $18.27 for that book. And Gore Shriek number one, I keep buying it. It currently has a cover price fair market value of $77. I think that's crazy high, uh, but still a $43.13 value add as we stand. I do believe that there are some individuals talking specifically about this book that is driving the interest in the book. And when interest is driven up, typically copies are scooped up increasing the fair market value. And I think that's what's happening to that book as I've seen the value of that book rise over the last couple of months, which is, again, one of the reasons why I picked it up because the price at mile high had remained static. Bloodstone number four, I purchased for $31.14. It's a $45 raw book for a $13.86 value add. $42.66 of value added on Gore Shriek number one again. $77 for that book raw and a $44.86 value add for Tales to Astonish number 85. I paid $109.14 for it 
and it has a fair market value of $154 raw. Vanguard Illustrated is another one I pick up, roughly $18 to buy this book on Mile High Comics. It has a fair market value of $42. So in total, about $200 of value added to my collection if I were to keep all of these books raw. Now I buy them near mint because I believe them to be 9.4 and not a range of what sellers like to tell you, which is near mint is supposed to be like 7.5 to 9.2. I think it's all made up. I do believe that Near Mint, according to all of the handbooks and guides and all the sites and you name it, it's 9.4. So if I switch all of these to 9.4, let's see if they have any value in a CGC 9.4. And very quickly, if we look at the CGC potential value add here, again, very positive returns at $173 for the first order and $214 in the second order. Now, the first thing that's interesting is that Tales to Astonish, number 85, $233 and a 9.4. That's why I was willing to spend so much for it because I knew it wasn't going to be a 9.8, but if I could potentially get it in a 9.4, it still has a lot of value where I could essentially double my money or at least add $92 of value to my collection getting that slabbed. Again, Gore Shriek by itself in a 9.4, not a 9.8, just a 9.4, $120. I'm happy to buy that book for $34 in both cases for these orders. Why am I buying a Darth Vader fourth print of a character's second appearance? Because I spent about 20 bucks to get it and in a 9.4, it's worth $140. So that lowered the risk of me purchasing it from mile high at that price because it has the potential to add $87 of value to my collection. Invincible number 115, $70 in a 9.4. So again, you can see where, yes, I'm expecting or hoping to get 9.8 candidates if possible, but I'm also very realistic, which is why I do the analysis on 9.4, because while I'm hopeful, I understand that I'm not going to really get 9.8s, but if I were to get a 9.8, and I think this is part of the fun, let's see what the order potential ceiling had across the two orders as I flip the grades to 9.8 and you see the values changing. This is at least fun for me to see kind of what if they were 9.8s, even though I know they're all not. The first order has a potential ceiling of $1,065, and the second order over $3,000 at $3,093, driven primarily by Tales to Astonish 85. With that corner the, and the shape that it's in, breaking color, it has no chance whatsoever of getting a 9.8, but I do like to see the potential value here. Gore Shriek in a 9.8, $517. Just mind-blowing to me that that book is holding that much value. Every book in this second order is well over 100. X and Furnace at 165. Until the, a lot of those copies are being sold for less than that and, and aligns itself with the market, I'm still going to buy it all day. $5.87, $6.34. I mean, it e, e could even lose 50% of its value and I'm still ahead. So I don't mind that book at all. Vanguard Illustrated in a 9.8, 287. Iron Man number 57, $363 in a 9.8. You can see why I wanted to pick it up at $43. G.I. Joe and Transformers number one, $359. And if you're saying there's no way that that book is not $359, let's look at a 9.8 recent sale. October 24th, 2023, $360 according to cover price. So that, that sale, legit or otherwise, it's in the price guides and I have to consistently use the data when I'm making my choices. And guess what? If I'm wrong and that's not a $350 book and you're telling me it's more like a 125 or maybe even a $75 value in a 9.8, I only spent $18 to get it, so no problem. Invincible 68, $325 in a 9.8. Potential to add $262 of value in my collection if these are 9.8. So I don't believe them all to be 9.8s, but this is a lot of fun for me to see what is that potential value but really happy from the raw value add perspective to add so much value to my collection by selecting these specific books. Now, as if this video isn't long enough, I want to demonstrate the full end-to-end -end process with you, and I'll try and go as quickly as I can, but I'm going to grade this X and Furnace issue and kind of walk you through from the point that I grade the book all the way through posting it for sale on eBay. 
you know, nothing up my sleeve. It's all legit, just a straightforward demonstration of the, the process that I've been working on. So what I end up doing is you saw it already cataloged in the spreadsheet and I make sure that I have the unique string identifier as X in furnace number one from 2008, just the standard cover A, so that it's associated with cover price and all my other values. So that's the first step is actually cataloging it in the spreadsheet. The second step, and I know this is going to blow people away that I do actually look at the back of the book when I grade is to take it out of the, the cheap bag and board and I will end up replacing it. But I will go ahead and give this book my assess grade. Now, the first thing I'll notice, there is a little bit of a, a chip right off of the front cover. So I'm already downgrading this to maxing out at 9.6, but looks to be pretty sharp around all of the edges. And if you disagree with the grade, that I finally assigned to the book, let me know. It's in this corner, a little, just just slightly soft, or almost like a piece of the corner is, is peeled back. That's typically okay, but I still mark the book down for that. And then we've got a color break and spine tick right there. So to me, between that defect, that defect, and the corner being soft, without even looking at the back, I'm thinking 9.4. Then looking at the back, this kind of exposes the corner a little bit more, which it pretty much, I don't think this makes the corner or the overall grade worse. I think it just confirms the condition of the corner of being what it is. And actually, as you look at it a little bit closer here in the light, you can see lots of non-color breaking ticks, very slight, but up and down, maybe like, I see like six to eight there. You can really make them out right there. And then one right here by the staple. This is where I'm starting to think 9.2, maybe 9.0. And it's borderline right now between a 9 and a 9.2. I personally feel like 9.0 is the correct grade just based on the number of ticks on the back. But I kind of did jump from 9.4. And was there really enough damage to the back to warrant it? losing two grade points essentially. Now I understand we're not going from 8.5 to 8, we're going from 9.4 to 9, not quite a significant jump, but just about the same. I want to settle in at 9.2. I think that's a fair assessment. I think 9's a little harsh. 9, I've seen some 9's with a lot of color breaks and I'm only seeing uh, two significant color breaks and by significant still like very minor and I think 9.2 is the correct grade for this book. Okay, so the next thing I'll do is I'll go ahead and put the grade that I'm going to give the book, which is 9.2 on the back, and then I will find the line item in the spreadsheet that corresponds to the book as once it's entered into my spreadsheet, I never change it, I never move it. So once it's in there, it's locked in. And so the spreadsheet line 10424, it sends up, that ends up being sort of my unique identifier that helps me build my SKU for this item. So you can see there, I've written 10424, and that corresponds to the spreadsheet line item with the grade of 9.2. Nothing too surprising here, just rebagging in my preferred BCW Silver Age bag and board. So here it is, all ready to go in a 9.2. And now I want to consider, will I sell this book? Uh, should it go in my PC? I really don't think it's going to benefit from a press. Yeah, some of the spine ticks on the back might come out, but is that really going to transform this book into a 9.4? It probably just reinforces the 9.2 in my opinion. So I didn't write any sort of press indicator or CPR indicator to say like, this should go in a queue that goes to presser A, B, or C. For me personally, I think that this book might be worthy of moving on from. I have other copies in a higher grade than this, and I'd prefer to keep those and maybe work on those books or have them worked on on my behalf or send them straight to CGC in a pre-screen, but I don't necessarily need another copy in this grade. Now I'll go back to my collection spreadsheet, and I'm going to simply enter my grade here, 9.2 and then see if any of the conditions change. Uh, $39 in a CGC 9.2, again, it's probably not worth the trouble to send in 
especially when you see the CGC potential value add zeroing out. It's a break even type of book. So to send that book in and hope for a 9.2 is probably not worth it. Now, instead of spending a lot of time trying to figure out, well, what should I sell the book for? You know, what is the list? What's a decent list price? In doing all of that research, I simply have done this already in my spreadsheet. It, this calculates everything for me under column AR, and this will automatically set the price for me at $23.99. And again, what I do is I prefer to list the book at a higher price and then let it decay over time until it meets the right buyer at the right time at the right price point. But it still gets me in the ballpark of a decent price for the book in this condition. So now I've got the price already predetermined and ready for the listing. So the only thing I wanna make note of is again, the, the 10424 line item. And as it corresponds to the back of the book here, now I am ready to tell my system to go ahead and post this book for sale. Okay, I've got everything wired up now and I'm just gonna run this in the console. And essentially this program will run against the line item 10424. And you'll see a lot of different things showing up here in the console. These are just messages that I output just so that I can see the program actually working. And it's going through, and as you can see, some of the information showing up as uh, X and Furnace. What it does is it creates a comic book object based on the row of my collection, and then it creates an eBay listing object that's appropriate for the eBay listing. And it is done, and I don't know if you saw this in the background, I forgot to point this out, but here uh, in this column AC, there's a Y under FS, which means for sale, so that if I click on this, we can now see that this book is officially for sale. X and Furnace, number one, 2008 Marvel Comics 9.2 Near Mint Minus. That's exactly how I want the title structured. It's using a stock image until I replace it with my own photograph, and it has all of the additional metadata with my disclaimers for the description of the auction in terms of uh, payment, shipping, returns, etc. But it has the series title set to X and Furnace, the issue number, the grade, the language, the publisher, all of these. It's called aspects in terms of the, the data structure, but it's all of those additional data elements that eBay typically asks you to add to enhance your listing and, and make it easier to find. And I also figured out how to enable offers for this book so that folks that think the $23.99 price is a little bit too much for a 9.2, they're welcome to click in and make an offer for it. So I hope you found that uh, little process interesting, difficult to demonstrate kind of live in real time, but the real key is keeping that row static so that that, it, that truly identifies your comic book item and then I'm able to use that data and have it auto publish into eBay. And the nice thing for me is that when the fair market value of any book I have for sale changes, the process will go in and automatically update the price on eBay so that I don't have a buyer picking up a book where the value has jumped so that I'm losing out and I don't have books listed too high when they have corrected down or fallen or maybe realigned with the market so that I don't have books up there for sale that are just sitting around because I've overpriced them at one point. And then I do take a decaying approach. And what I mean by that is it, I'm going to list that book. It already is listed, in fact, for $23.99. What I'm going to do is over time decrease the price by some percentage. And so what I will do is I will figure out the original time that the listing was created and then at some frequency have a calculation performed so that $23.99 becomes $22.99, maybe becomes $20, $17, $15, $12 until the book is sold. Because like I said, I have many copies of X and Furnace number one. I'm really only interested in keeping the highest grades in my collection or sent off for grading. And since I can't travel to Mile High Comics myself and actually finger their books, I have to buy them sight unseen, assume some risk, keep the best comics in my collection, and then share out some of the books that basically didn't meet the cut. And then over time, selling the book under fair market value, giving a buyer 
an opportunity to acquire the book and maybe a little bit of a lesser grade or something that more aligns with their budget. Let me know if you have any questions about this process. Thank you for your patience. Would love to get your feedback, uh, any suggestions for me on anything I would change. But I think this automated selling routine, it's really inspired me to make some adjustments to some of the cues and how I collect and maybe take a little bit of my emotional attachment away from the books and just be honest with myself and find opportunities to let some books go and further refine my collection. Thanks for watching, happy collecting, and see you next time.